Hello, welcome to Unscripted Spaghetti, the podcast. It's back. It never left. It's still here. This week, we're talking about some heady, heady things. I got caught up in a binge of all type. I got caught up in an Alan Watts binge, some Ram Dass. I saw some stuff about dopamine homostasis. Um, I learned about allostasis. I learned about relief. Um, what did I learn about? What a, what is this thing called? This thing is called a thing. It's called the opponent process theory. Uh, it's things going on in your brain. It's quite literally heady things. Um, then I was like, wait a minute. Didn't I take a philosophy class once? And I did, it turns out. And I remembered things about it. And uh, mainly, uh, I got kind of wrapped back up in looking at the logic aspect of it. It was, um, we talked about moral philosophy, but we also talked about logic. It was kind of like broken up into two, two sections. And I remember, I remember liking the logic a little, like the logic was a little bit, um, it, it was kind of like, uh, it's like math of philosophy. It's like the math portion of philosophy almost. It's kind of like. A good example is philosophy or more or they, but logic is like it's a lot of like it's like no a is b c is a so c is not b because no a is b and a is c so a plus b squared plus c squared equals not a squared that kind of stuff there are um uh, we talk, I learned about, I learned about some stuff. I learned about inductive, deductive, and abductive reasoning, different types of reasonings. Um, and we're going to talk about stuff. We're going to talk about GRU. It's a little, little goofy thing. Um, um, and yeah, we're going to get into it. So, um, let's start with old Mr. Watts, Alan Watts. Everybody knows who Alan Watts is. He's a man. He was a man. He's a dead man now. He has died. He doesn't exist anymore. Um, he was a, I think he was a philosopher. Um, let's look him up. What is this man doing? Um... He was an English writer, a theologian, and speaker for a Western audience. He got really into uh, Zen Buddhism and things like that. And he had a way of just kind of communicating it to a Western audience for them to be, to take interest in it because uh, I guess they needed that. They needed a fella to speak their language about it. He talks a lot about he like um, he'll talk about the Bible and like kind of like he he he's a, he does a good job at like blending Western and Eastern I guess ideologies together and kind of like talking to people. Um, the the video I was watching it's on YouTube. It's like overthinking will kill your reality. He's talking about you know you think too much, man. You're thinking all the time, and if you're thinking all the time, that's too much. You're um. You're not paying attention to what's going on. You're not in reality. You're in your head. You're in your thoughts. And you're putting too much um, weight on those things. And you're not embracing reality. Because reality is separate from you. Or it's at least it's separate from your thoughts. You know, it's like your inner little sanctum. Uh, reality kind of doesn't give a crap about it. It doesn't care what you think. It is what it is. You're in it. But you're also able to project out of it through your brain. And uh, he talks about like, you know, that about thinking too much. And like the, I mean, it's like a, I don't know, it was like a 30 minute little lecture he gave, but he ends up talking about what stuck out with that and how I'm going to try to wrap it up with all this. Um, as he talks about this idea of like, you have your like imperfect self and you're thinking about how you don't want to be your imperfect self so you go off to try to like not be your imperfect self and you try to chase this this wacky dream of some like enlightened perfect version of yourself 
he gives an example of like priests, how priests uh, try to be really, really uh, like good servants of God, but and how uh, you know people you're like you're selfish, you try to be less selfish, and he he talks about how it's all spawning from you. It's all spawning from your imperfect self. So that kind of like hunt of improvement in itself is a little imperfect and it's all very heady. It's like, I was thinking about when I was hearing it and I was like, yeah, but what about like, it has this idea of like, um, you're, you're fine or you, you can't change yourself. And that's kind of an aligning thing. That's kind of like a freeing thing. It doesn't have to be this negative thing. I'm like, well, what about people who like need to change themselves? You know, like there are things that are bad habits that we can um, uh, collect and get into. And then you find yourself just doing them, addictions and stuff like that. And he had, he's this whole thing of like, I, I embrace my uh, imperfect self and all this stuff. And just kind of like, in, I, I don't know. I don't want to say it's like, like a light and mindset, but, um, it's kind of this idea of like stop chasing that idea of an enlightened mindset and accept yourself. And that was like a big part of it. But I think it's interesting because um, I guess it's not really, I can't find anything proven or anything, but he was a bit of a, a drinker. He was a bit of an alcoholic. Um, and people were concerned about his alcoholism leading to his death. And then he indeed did die and, uh, there's some rumors that go around that circulate that he died of alcoholism. So it's kind of interesting because I'm listening to this thing and he has this whole thing of like, you have your, your mess, your cluttered mess of yourself and you're trying to, and he's talking more of like a, like a, I guess kind of like a spiritual journey of accepting yourself and all that stuff. But this idea of you can't change yourself. And I'm just coming from another video that talks about like, um, practical ways or uh, I guess this one person's idea of a practical way to um cure curb your addictions and uh, that's kind of like a sense of like how to change yourself how to improve yourself how to fix yourself and break bad habits meanwhile he's talking in this spiritual sense of like don't chase after the buddha don't don't chase after like a christ figure don't try to become enlightened and all that stuff you can't change yourself. You are who you are. You're kind of set. It's okay. Just experience it. Meanwhile, he, he seemed to have suffered from drinking a little too much and a sense of alcoholism, um, which affected his health. So it's kind of like this, I don't know. I feel like there's like, like a, it's again, it's kind of like the idea of like a, I guess, spiritual practice versus a more tangible practice. But, I don't know. That was, that was something that I was, I, I noted, but, um, the point he was saying is that like you trying to change yourself comes from the imperfect self and therefore it is like an imperfect chase. Um, I'm probably getting it all wrong anyway, but he gives examples of like, you want to be less selfish, but that in itself is a selfish desire. Um, a priest wants to be closer to God, but that in itself is just because God's the big boss and you just want to be on the big boss's side. And he's like, you know, like the, some of the greatest priests are kind of aware of this. Like the only reason they're doing all this is because they don't want to, they believe that they're going to get in trouble. And it's this idea of like, you're putting the weight and the, the, uh, the, the power onto these beliefs because of your thoughts so in order to break that, I guess, kind of think a little less and stop putting so much weight on your thoughts and just kind of having a sense of an acceptance of yourself, which as I think is an important thing. And again, I, I was also, I kind of went on like a Ram, da, a Ram Dass, uh kick and he, I was listening to a really nice thing he was talking about where he's talking about like switching channels and viewing life in a different way where you're on channel, you're on this channel and you see you and you see a person and then you switch to another channel and, and you're like, I'm, I'm this name. I do these things. Um, I work here and stuff like that. And you switch to another channel and then you're looking at yourself and people and you're like, I'm a, I'm a happy person. 
that's a sad person that's that's an angry person and you kind of you see each other in a sense of like emotional and psychological states and then you switch another channel and then he's like you got people who are like oh that's a that's a um, Sagittarius that's a that's a Leo that's a Aquarius and they're you know like this uh, astrological kind of way of looking at people and then you, like, you switch another switch and now you're looking at people um, I don't know if there was another one, but you look at, he's like, now you're looking at just like a being and you realize you're a being with your life and your experience. And now you're looking at someone else who's just another living being and they have their life and they have their experiences and they're not those life. They're not that life. They're not those experiences. There's not, they're not those psychological and emotional states. They're a being experiencing those things. And then you switch another state switch and now you're looking at things and you realize like it's kind of like you're like looking at like one thing you realize those beings are all one thing and it's like this interconnectedness um kind of looking at things and then he says you switch one more switch and now you're looking at the void the unnameable thing the unexplainable thing the unlabelable thing and he's like, that's kind of like the sense of that's like God. And that's, that's like the alpha and the omega, the simultaneous existence of beginning and end. The, uh, the thing that can't really be because it's opposing things, but simultaneous, it's, it's everything, it's nothing, it's, it's existing, it's not existing. And that's also you. And that was a cool thing. And I was hearing these and I was like I like all this stuff I'm into this I'm picking it up but then also at the same time I've been looking at like these other things which are much more like concrete like let's look at the synapses in your freaking brain and like the the chemicals that are being released and learning about this stuff and how we've been able to learn about these things and it gives you like a much more practical way of looking at it and it's a much it's kind of like a more effective way of looking at it and i uh, i guess that kind of like is the big argument of like the whole spiritual kind of like uh transcendental aspect of things and the the more scientific more studied and just like this is what's happening with you and this is how you can correct things and i'm not one to say want to see this is why this side's bogus because of this and this is why this side's bogus because of that or this is why this side's uh not as great as we might want to think it is because it gets i don't know um to compete com to combat each up each side and take each side and um have them duke it out and say which is the best way because i talked about on the podcast before maybe i don't know what i've talked about on this thing but uh the idea of like when I took philosophy originally, okay, we're we're jumping into the philosophy stuff right now. When I when I took it originally, I kind of had this idea, or when I would look at it, in any time, um, I had this idea that like it had to be. You, it's like you're picking the best one, and you're like, all right, I'm a Stoic because I like the way the Stoics do things. All right, I'm a I'm a hedonist because I like the way the OG hedonist, which isn't what we think it is, which is the overindulgent stuff because true hedonism is to have happiness um all the time forever so you can't overindulge on something like alcohol or uh foods or anything like that because if you overindulge on alcohol you get a hangover and then you have to spend an entire day feeling like crap um that's not providing you with the happiest life like it's not just hedonism as this we have this idea that hedonism is taking the things that making us happy and just doing a lot of them because it's going to make us really happy but true hedonism had a much more like long-term goal which was like i always want to be happy therefore i can't over consume i have to, i can't be overly attached to these things because they are limited they over consumption can give you problems and I don't want to be missing things. I don't want to be dealing with physical symptoms that are unpleasant because I've overindulged on certain things. And 
So that's true hedonism is kind of like a long-term look at obtaining happiness constantly and remaining in that state, uh, which has a lot more going on into it than just like do all the stuff you like doing as much as you can all the time forever because that's just not how things work because your mind can be like, Hey, that's fun. I like to do those things. Let's do them all forever and I'll be happy. But reality doesn't give a shit what your mind thinks. And reality is going to be like, Hey, now you're hung over. Now you got some health issues. Now you got things going on. That's reality. These things affect your body. Doesn't matter if your brain's like, this is great. So, uh, I had this idea that like, you know, it's like, you've got to pick the best philosophy. You got to figure it out. But really they're just all different things and you should just learn a lot of things and live your life. And as things come to you, you assert or utilize ideologies that you've come across when needed and you don't assert them at times when they're not needed. And it's more just about like expanding the way in which you can rationalize and see things. And I kind of think the same way with these things, with this idea of like, you know, there is no you, there is no self in the greatest terms of looking at everything. Uh, and you are kind of like stuck within yourself. There's only so much you can kind of change about yourself. There is no goal to reach this enlightened, perfect state. These are just your mind over like fantasizing and putting too much emphasis on realities or people in reality and goals that you project and say like, well, if I can do that, then I can be better and I can do that and I can be better. And you're chasing your imperfect self is chasing an imperfect chase to get to the perfect version of yourself that doesn't really exist. And understanding that and freeing yourself from those chases are good. And understanding that like all these variations of identity that you might have really accumulate to, you know, possibly nothing by the end of it all. Cause you just die and you become nothing. So accepting those things and kind of like loot getting free off those things is a great, good feeling. But at the end of the day, you do need to kind of improve. There are things you kind of might need to improve about yourself. Not you in particularly. You're perfect. You're doing great. I love you. But more so like if there is something that you want to improve or people in your life are saying, hey, you kind of suck. Uh, get your shit together. There are ways to go about it and it can be done and it'll probably improve your life if you do them. So it's just this like nice balance of kind of accepting yourself, but also improving yourself. And you kind of just move around in those little pockets. So like, let me improve myself, but let's not take it too serious. Let's relax a little bit, but let's tighten up and get focused. And I don't know, I guess that's what I kind of try to do. I try to just bounce around because I can get really caught up on this idea of like, let me continuously improve or let me overanalyze myself and say, what do I need to get rid of? What do I need to fix? And in doing those things, I found it much harder to do. I found it much harder to get on the habits I wanted to have and release the habits I didn't want to have because I think it just puts more so much pressure on you and makes it that much harder to just do the things that are proven ways to do it. So I don't know. It kind of helps to just utilize both those things and accept your flaws and not put so much pressure on yourself. And then also find that routine of proven methods to help you improve. And now we're going to talk about these methods. We're done talking about dumb hippie stuff. We're getting into hard hitting theories that may be true because they're only theories. So dopamine homostasis is a uh, homostasis of dopamine. A classical neurotransmitter is a key indicator of neural health. 
Dysfunction is a regulation of dopamine of the regu- in the regulation of dopamine is implicated in a long list of neurological disorders, including addiction, depression, and neurodi- neurodegeneration. So basically you're, you know, you're hooked on things, you get sad, your brain, your neuros are degeneratizing. And it could be an homostasis of dopamine is a is a part of uh, maintaining health so these things don't happen. And what it is, is homostasis is balance. So your brain's in a good balanced place. And this video I was watching, Dr. Ann Lembrook, L-E-M-B-K-E. Look her up. Because this is what she's talking about. And I'm just talking about what she's talking about. And she's the one who knows what she's talking about. So look her up. Anna Lembk, L-E-M-B-K-E. She talks about how your brain wants homostasis. It wants to be in balance. And it's going to put you in balance. Or it's going to attempt to put you in balance. It has these ways of... um getting back to that homostasis and she talks about how like um you know dopamine levels and all that stuff like even she she talks about like stress is um anything that's not just bad like it's not just like oh i'm stressed i'm i'm feeling stress it's also like um like extreme pleasure is also a state of stress it's a version of it we kind of just don't recognize it as that uh that's how biologists uh, define it it's so it's when you're out of balance in either direction you're under stress because stress is just straining something you know um biologists so biologists see stress like that they don't just see it as like oh i'm i'm stressed because i'm i'm having pressure put on me it's like you're also stressed when you bend the other way and you have pressure put on you in a positive way. Anyway. Uh, so she talks about this going on, how we're like really um, kind of over, over saturated in dopamine responses. You know, we got video games. We got, you know, you get, you get a text message and your brain goes, Ooh, you you get a like on Twitter and your brain goes, ooh, you get a, you, you get a, there's all kinds of things that you can just look at and your brain goes, ooh, especially with, when you got the internet. And what happens is, so the opponent process theories is um, basically a theory that's kind of saying that like when your brain goes through Let's say your brain goes through an immense amount of um, happiness. Like you, um, yeah, you go through something. It makes you really happy. And you're like, we, well, your brain wants to go back. It throws you out of a homostasis. So your brain wants to pull you back in homostasis. So to do that, it um, basically kind of fires off. I guess it kind of creates a sense of negative feelings after the good feelings to kind of bring it back and that's kind of like the sense of like when you like the sense of wanting to do it again whenever you you feel something really happy you have this moment where you're like oh i want to do it again but i kind of am sad because it's it's like a sad feeling of wanting to do it again it's not just like i'm excited to do it again i mean you you get excited before you, when you're about to do it again but it's it's like this feeling of like chasing that um that that initial happiness because that's a big part she says that's like a big part of like the dopamine system is the desire to chase and achieve it as well so you kind of get thrown into this negative space and it's this feeling of like you're kind of like it's that feeling of like you want to do it again and you're kind of sad that you're not doing it again and i've had a feeling where had this really big event like you do something for the first time and then you're like that was great i want to do it again but then and eventually you don't know this you don't always know this but eventually the more this happens to you the more you realize it the second time you do it it's not as fun 
it's not as good the second time. Then you do it a third time, it's not as good. This is all part of this opponent um, uh, process theory as well. Um, but like the more you do things, the more the less fun it gets. And eventually you kind of get, when you feel that feeling of like, oh, I want to do that thing again that I just did for the first time, that was really fun. Um, you might catch a glimpse of this extra little layer of sadness to it because you're like, Oh, even if I did it again, it wouldn't be the first time again. I remember I I hiked the Appalachian Trail and I was lying in bed when I was done. And I was like, man, that was so crazy. I was just kind of like feeling all the emotions of like wanting to do it again. And I was like, that was so crazy. I was like, oh, I want to do it again. But I got sad. I was like thinking of how fun it was, but I was feeling sad because I wasn't doing it anymore. It was over and I want to do it again, but also... Because I could never do it again for the first time. And it was the first time I ever kind of like, like took note of that feeling of like being sad that even if I did it again, it wouldn't be the same time. It wouldn't, it still wouldn't be that experience. And it was the first time I kind of got caught the glimpse of this idea of like, I'm chasing something that's already passed that, that I can't get back. I can't redo this event again. I could do the trail again, but I'm not going to do the same events again. And I thought it was just kind of like a nostalgia thing or like a, like, a, oh, time keeps slipping by, you know. But I, I, it might be kind of more related to this whole, I mean, I'm sure it all is just, ner I mean, your whole brain's just juices and zaps, right? So it was probably a part of this whole thing of like this feeling of like, sadness that I felt from this overwhelmingly joyous time I had that is now being drugged back down and creating this homostasis of like well you can never do it again so be kind of sad about it better chase something else so you can get that dopamine again and um it talks about in this thing um it, the the opponent process theory may explain situations where something unpleasant can be rewarding. The theory has been applied to understanding job satisfaction. The theory is linked to a person's emotions and their behavior. The research on the theory has shown relief of physical pain. The relief from physical pain can bring about pleasant feelings, and reduce negative ones. Opponent process theory has also been explained ability to see colors, which we're not going to get into that. But I was like, whoa, what? But they talk about, with this thing, they talk about how, like, like skydivers. They, they did a study where, like, skydivers who have been skydiving for a long time, they're, they're just jumping out of planes, dude. Like, they don't even, they're just like, whatever. They've done it so many times. And then newer people who jump out of planes, they're like, oh, this is crazy. They're, they're losing their crap. Um, and part of that is this um, uh, opponent process theory because... In this video with uh, Dr. Anna, she talks about how, you know, so you do a good thing and then the brain's like, all right, be kind of sad and have the desire to do it again. And then you do it again. But then as, you, but you do it like more because you've already done it once and you're kind of numb to it. So you do it a little bit more. Well, opposite of that, the longing feeling also grows. And if you just continuously don't, if you just continuously get overwhelmed with dopamine responses, the, the negative responses pile up too. And eventually that can lead to like depression and anxiety and all these um, issues going on with you because you've collected this massive pile of like, kind of like underlying sadness that's just sitting there with you now and this the good things are no longer affecting you because you've become accustomed to them and then you get into a state and there's she probably could talk about this more uh more more better more good but um i'm doing my best i'm doing my best y'all uh and what happens is that is a state of allostasis it's not homostasis it's allostasis allostasis it's bad news. Um, allostasis load refers to the accumulative burden of chronic stress and life events. It involves the interaction of different psychological systems at varying degrees of activity. 
When environmental challenges exceed the individual's ability to cope, then allostasis overload ensues. Um, allostasis is literally maintaining stability stability of homostasis through change so this is like what helps you get back to homostasis oh man this stuff's confused this stuff's above my pay grade uh so basically it's it's an over production of stress hormones that make you feel like you got to constantly chase something to get you back to feeling good again um yeah the process by which the body responds to stressors in order to regain homostasis homeostasis yeah homeostasis um but it was an interesting thing um kind of bouncing back and forth this week between these heady spiritual-esque um like ideologies of the mind and self and then coming to this place where there's just like it's just your freaking brain juices and brain zaps like you do too much good things, your brain's like, let's uh, do, you do a good, you feel a good thing, your brain makes an equally, makes an equal feeling of a bad thing to balance it out. Uh, if you do too much good things, you become desensitized to that and your body collects this massive amount of negative things to balance you out. She goes on to talk about like, when people come to her with, um, like depression, um, like anxiety, insomnia, and these things like that, or addiction, um, to just do a dopamine detox to kind of like, um, to kind of cut out things that kind of make you happy and stop chasing those little happy goals because it'll help re- get rid of that allostasis. It'll help get rid of these negative little responses that are happening in you because you're not feeding your brain the dopamine anymore. So you kind of like, because like if you cut out the dopamine, then you're cutting out the negative responses that try to counterbalance it. And then slowly you bring that down and then slowly it gets, it stops being produced as well. Well, that's just what they were talking about. Um, Cause we kind of have this natural um, drive to like get to pleasure. Like we just naturally want to get to pleasure, but here in our current kind of time and area of life and you know society there's there's a lot of little pleasures that you can just get really quickly and they kind of don't lead anywhere either like they're just they're just like bing i got one bing i got one bing i got one and then your brain's just like going and going and firing you're just going on all these little dopamine hits and then simultaneously your brain's trying to like be like all right let's uh let's get let's not go too far that way let's bring it back let's create that homo homeostasis so let's get negative 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 and then you're like but it, it's so weird it's so strangely kind of like uh the way i'm understanding it it seems counterintuitive because it's like all right i'm 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 chasing the good all right well we're gonna make you feel bad which in turn makes you want to chase more good and then you chase more good and then you collect more bad and then you become numb to the good so then the, the good stops working and now you're just, but the bad stays bad. It's, it's huge now. And it's these big, like m- massive, like feelings. And, uh, uh, I don't know. It's a wild, it's a wild thing, but I can feel it. You know, I can feel kind of like, I feel like I've gone through things where I, I felt all this stuff before. Like I, I don't understand it, but I feel it like a hippie really ought to do. And it's just these feelings of like, I've chased, I've had that like over explosion of like dopamine in my brain. And then I've done these events and like had these experiences where I've just had so much fun and such a good time. And then afterwards, I'm just left with this feeling of wanting to do it more. I just want to, I just want to do it again. And then it's hard to do it because the happiness is already kind of depleted when I try to do it again. You know, I noticed, um, it's like I did a little experiment on myself when I was a little kid as like a, like a rat in a cage. Um, I remember we would get string cheese, um, as a, as a snack when we were little kids and me and my sister would each get a pack or we'd get one pack and in the pack 
there are five, ten strips of cheese. So we'd split it five and five. And my sister would eat one little piece of cheese every day after school. And she'd have one throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, through Friday. And she'd eat her cheese. And my uh, little dumb ass would be like, that cheese is good. I like cheese a lot, so I'm just going to eat one as soon as I get home. And then I remember I was like outside of the fridge just bouncing around being like, I'll eat one more. And then I had two. And then Sunday comes, and I'm like, dang, I want to wait till after school and do an after school snack. But dang, I got all day, and I got three pieces of cheeses. You know how that goes. So I would eat them all by the end of the weekend. It'd be over. And I would just like be flabbergasted that my sister could do that. I'm like, how do you do it? Like, it doesn't make sense. And I guess that kind of shows like, I guess, I don't know what it shows. It shows that I really like cheese. I'll tell you that. But if it, it, I had that feeling of just kind of like, I remember sitting at the, like that feeling of like, I ate something I really like. And now I have this incredible like craving to do it again because me not doing it is kind of like this feeling of not feeling good. Like it's like I don't really feel good because I'm not doing the thing that I just enjoy doing anymore and I want to go and do it again. And uh, then you over consume your cheese and now you got to go a whole week feeling that that build up of, of wanting to do it to eat more cheese and that was I look back and I was like man that's that was like that's like the signs of like it's clearly signs of addictive behavior like as a as a kid that's like my kid version of being like like I'm five days off cheese I'm looking for a fix um and um it kind of like realizing that was kind of a thing where I was like, huh, I might have like an addictive personality, which I knew. And I look back and I can see all these other signs. I mean, I think some of that stuff's genetic and stuff as well, but whatever, I'm not gonna get into that, but it's, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I feel all these feelings. I get what they're saying and it makes sense to me to hear this. So it's an interesting thing. And I think it's, I think it's good to know because if you know these things, you can like put them into practice and be like, okay, so I'm kind of like chasing my own tail with these things that maybe aren't the best for you, but give you these quick releases of feeling good because you, you feel the quick release and then your brain's literally counterbalancing you by being like, Hey, be sad that you can't do it anymore. And then also, hey, it's not as good any, anymore. And maybe that's like the sign of your brain being like, stop doing it, you know. But I think they talk about how this can honestly be like mountain climbers get so used to the fear or the, the adrenaline of climbing mountains like rock climbers that like they become kind of like used to it and numb to it. So this can be this whole um, opponent process theory, I think, because what I'm looking at a lot of it's like, it can help with like um, trauma and fears and stuff like that by being exposed to it because you get used to it and you build up like a tolerance, but it can also cause issues, which makes sense because this whole thing's about balance. So it makes sense that it would both could possibly fuck you up and not. But that's enough about uh, your brain. It's a weird place. Don't think too much about it. Don't think too much don't do it um now we're gonna go into even more just stuff that doesn't make sense but does at the same time um we're gonna talk about logic right is that what this stuff is yeah it's a logic so i learned about inductive inductive i'm not even saying the word right induction abduction and deduction um they're forms of reasoning. They're ways in which you get in arguments and you make these types of arguments or these types of conclusions. Um, they all have, prim I think that's called a premise. You got yourself a premise and then you got yourself a conclusion. Um, um, so deductive reasoning takes 
um, premises um, that are supposed to be true. They're supposed to be true statements. And then with these premises, you can conclude that a third idea is also true. Here's a little example. Um, all men are mortal. Harold is a man. Therefore, Harold is a mortal. So because the first two premises are true, we can assume that the third one is... We can make an, a conclusion about Harold. That's deduction. It's like forward thinking. Um, whereas induction is kind of like backwards thinking. You get like an idea, you get some support for a conclusion and you kind of backtrack through the premises to get to it. Um, here's an example. I have a bag of mini coins and I've pulled out 10, pen, 10 randomly and they've all been pennies. Therefore, this bag is full of pennies. Um, deductions like much more like yeah this is what it is like as long as the premises are true like the premises are just wrong then deduction kind of seems to fall apart but induction can kind of be a little tricky and because like the bag might not be full of pennies the bag might just have a lot more pennies than any other coins it could literally be 99 pennies and a dime you know chances are if you pull out 10 random coins they're going to be pennies and then abduction is like some detective stuff it's taking um several different it, it takes a lot of um oh gosh i'm losing all my words a lot of premises a lot of um things and then it makes a probable decision or conclusion out of them uh, it starts with an observation or set of observations and then seeks the simplest and most likely conclusion from the observations um Induction kind of works backwards. It takes um, a conclusion and then you work back to figure out what's going on. Um, whereas um, abduction takes a bunch of um, observations and comes to a conclusion. Um, I remember learning about logic and I liked it. It was interesting. I liked the I liked breaking things down and breaking down the arguments and kind of seeing like are these sound argu arguments i think that's kind of like a lot about what this is it's not so much about is this true is this a fact as much as is, is like is this a sound argument is this a sound way of thinking and deciding things um again if a equals b b equals c then a equals c deduction has a theory it makes it a hypothesis a hypothesis it makes an observation it gets a confirmation that confirmation supports the theory an induction takes a theory, then it looks for an observation, then it looks for a pattern, and then it makes a tentative hypothesis. Now, this one guy, this smart fella, smart fella named Goodman, smart man named Goodman, uh, created this idea, this argument to kind of like bust up inductive thinking a little bit with this thing called Guru. So Gru is a made-up thing, but it um, essentially says all things before a fixed time, T, um, an object seen or observed before this time is Gru and is green, and all things green are Gru. Anything, and then after this allotted time, this certain time, all things Gru uh kind of become blue so here we have this thing where it's like okay here's a time before this time all things green are grew and after this time all things grew turn blue so you think of something green you think of grass we know that grass does not in fact turn blue after a certain amount of time but if we observed the grass before the time and it's green, therefore it is grew. Therefore it should turn blue. And it kind of, uh, like I said, a lot of it is over my pay grade, what I'm talking about. But, you know, uh, it, it's a way of kind of like busting up the um, induction way of thinking because it, the induction way of thinking can cause you to think you 
can predict the future when you can't. Um, and that's kind of like what his point was saying with this. He's like, just because you make like an observation and uh, doesn't mean that it's going to um, come true. You know, like you just because you have this theory and you observe it and you see a pattern doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Um, and then this other guy, um, who was this fella? This other fella, Hume, he says, you know, after being kind of, I guess, pointing out, after Goodman pointed out this problem with, um, induction saying deductive is good because it's taking observations and then pointing them out. He points out, um, that observations of one kind of event follow one another kind of event results in a habit of regularity. Um, predictions are then based off regularities or habits of the mind. So he was kind of saying that like, um, deduction is also kind of a tricky thing because it causes you to make predictions on just patterns and that you're connecting. So you kind of get on like a one-way track of thinking when you do induction, deduction a little bit too long or or focus or rely too much on deduction. And then, you know, they keep going. And this is like something that um, I kind of decided not to like look too much into philosophy after this because when I was taking the class, I kind of realized like, oh, it feels like it's just people being like, this is how it is. And then someone just goes, no, 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 this is how it is. And then someone else goes, no, 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 this is how it is. But that's how it is. That's how most things are. So if you want to learn things, you're kind of like just going to be in that pattern a lot of the times of just people disagreeing and proposing new ideas. One of the videos I was watching, though, had a really good way of looking at philosophy where like, or philosophy and logic and stuff like that, where it's like, you shouldn't ever take on this idea of like, it's bad to be wrong because, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's attaching your ego to it. And that's attaching like your, yourself, you're putting too much weight on your thoughts again, and you're not looking at the reality of it. And you should actually be seeking that idea that someone's like, proven you wrong because now you're able to see reality a little bit clearer you've you're you've been broken free of the illusions that your thoughts are casting on yourself and you've see reality a little bit better now and that's ultimately the goal ultimately kind of the goal of this of philosophy and the, the goal of this way of thinking is to like see reality clearer so you shouldn't be attached to these thoughts that you have too much you should if you you know, challenge them, do the, do the little debates, do the arguments, do your deduction of your inductive reasoning, your abductive reasoning. But if someone proves you wrong and you're caught, you don't have to go, whoa, 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 oh, and like freak out because you should be happy. Your, your thoughts have been broken. You've been freed of disillusion and now you see reality a little bit better. And, uh, that's good. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, got on this kick this is the unprepared for podcast that i prepared for and it's marginally kind of feels the same i don't know seeing if it maybe if i prepared something it'd be a little bit nicer this time but who knows i don't i don't listen to this shit uh next stuff is uh, science, the week of science. So they touched the sun. They touched it, not with their fingers, but with a satellite dish or a spacecraft of some type. Um, an incredible historic feat, a human man-made spacecraft has swooped in and made contact with the sun. And guess what? They didn't name it Icarus. That's my take from this. They didn't Name it Icarus. I guess that'd probably be like a bad omen. But at this moment, it'd be like, it'd be like he did it. He finally did it. Uh, Parker Solar Probe. So Parker flew up to the sun, the solar corona, the upper atmosphere of the sun. And it took some pictures. It did some stuff. 
and hung out, had a good time, and it got out. It got out safe and sound, undamaged. It shows that their uh, shield, their high tech heat shielding system that they're using is super dope, super right on. Um, so yeah, they did that, or maybe they didn't. I mean, I was reading this and I was like, dude, people think the Earth's flat. This is wild. Like imagine being like the Earth, the Earth, the pancake, and the sun ain't real or something. And then people are like, we fucking touched it with a satellite. And you're like, nah, oh, man, fuck that. That's wild. Ice shelf of the Antarctic Doomsday Glacier won't last five years. This in on the we're fucked alert. Um, a crucial ice shelf of the Antarctic Thwartes Glacier is on track to collapse within five years, uh, accelerating the melting of the notorious Doomsday Glacier. It could raise the sea level up about, you know, I think at you know any much might be too much, but uh, basically, they took some satellite photos of this thing. It was super cracked. This spider webbing all over the place. That means more water gets into it, melts faster, it'll break off. Oceans levels will rise. Uh it's wild. We're touching the sun with spacecrafts. And we got doomsday melt glaciers melting. Um it's rough stuff. Rough stuff. But at the same time, new anti aging vaccine has increased the mouse lifespan. Would it work on humans? Uh, it might. It might work on humans. Uh, they don't know yet. Uh, they think the data was extremely strong. Basically, this vaccine targets senescent cells, which stop working. Uh, they they stop uh, multiplying. They then cause inflammation. The body doesn't really get rid of them. They kind of loiter around. Uh, they damage other healthy cells because they're mucking up the stuff. And this can cause cancers and Alzheimer's and other things. So, yeah. They've created a vaccine that prevents this kind of stuff from happening. It's working on the mice. They're spry. They're youthful. They're living it up. They're, they're going to the beach this weekend. The mice are doing great and you can maybe one day take a shot that keeps you from aging and then you can be young and beautiful when the ice cap floods your home or something you know it's great it's good stuff um uh we saw a giant eruption from a dragon star uh pretty cool it's a yellow dwarf much like our sun it exploded uh it uh it freaked them out a little bit they they kind of saw that this the suns and stars are a little less stable than they thought. Uh, which ain't no good. But who knows? Maybe we'll learn a little bit more about that from this Parker. Uh, who went down and touched the sun. That's science. That's some good news. Some bad news. Some good news. Some bad news. Some, some information. I hope you found this episode to be educational or enlightening either way. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, um, I gave it a shot. I gave it a shot talking about things that I don't understand that well, but I like, I think they're interesting. I like to watch them. I like to learn about them and every day I kind of get them a little bit more. I feel like, but, um, uh, what else? Let's see. Spaghetti recap. Uh, I got some new dumbbells. I'm getting beefy. No big deal. Um, I took my dog to the vet. She's doing great. I bought her some toothpaste. No big deal. Um, it's almost Christmas. Next week will be the Christmas episode. Tune in. Enjoy the, the Christmas episode. Maybe we'll talk about some Christmas lore. Some possible uh theories of what christmas is what's it about is it just a marketing campaign for coca-cola and polar bears is it a hedonistic celebration from the roman and celtic fusions of religions to pacify an entire group of people 
is it uh satan is it actually all actually satan like everything else might be who knows tune in next week and we won't have any of these answers but we'll talk about them maybe unless i forget anyway that's the podcast and it's over